Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Benjamin, and welcome to my Action RPG Godot tutorial series. I'm really excited for this series. We're going to be making the base for a small action RPG game. I'm going to show you right here what we're going to be making. So we've got a little character that can move around on the screen. We've got enemies with an artificial intelligence. They can damage us. We can damage them with our sword. We can roll around. We've got collisions set up with these walls right here. And that's an auto tile. We've got collisions with these trees, with this grass. We've got health. There's hit boxes and hurt boxes. All the basics that you need for an action RPG. Now, this is going to be the scope of the project. We likely won't do a lot more than this. I want to keep it pretty simple. This will already probably span, I would guess, somewhere around 20 to 30 different videos in order to make this. So it's going to take us a while, but I think the payoff will be great, and I think we'll have a lot of fun along the way. So let's get started. We're going to open up Godot. I'm using, I'm using Godot version 3.2 stable. Uh, there's a new 3.2.1 stable today. I might end up downloading that and starting to use that as well. So once we open it up, we're going to do a new project. Oh, and before I get into this, I want to say that this is going to be fairly beginner friendly, but I do expect you to have some knowledge of programming, but you don't have to have a lot. It's going to be mainly aimed at beginners. So I'll do my best to explain things as I go along, but if you've never done any programming in your life, you might want to go look at some other basic programming videos first, to learn about variables and functions and stuff, because I'm not going to explain all of those in great detail. But other than that, it's beginner friendly. So we're going to create a new project. We did new project over there. We need to pick a folder to put it in. So I'm going to do browse right here and come into a folder that I want to put it in. You guys can put it in any folder that you choose. We'll do YouTube tutorial videos here and select current folder and we'll call this make our name here action RPG and create folder create and edit and that should open it up here. Now I need to actually import the resources for this and you guys should find the resources for this inside of, I'll, I'll put a link to the source, the GitHub source to this project in the description. And so you can find that and then go download the zip file in there called Action RPG Resources. So you can download that zip file, unzip it, and import these resources into your project as well. And you can see I've just opened it up right here. I'm gonna select all of these folders and I'm going to drag it and drop it into this little file system down here and Godot will import those. Oops, we're actually going to we're actually going to delete those. Because we actually want to make sure that it imports them properly for brights. So let's do this again here. Let me move this out of the way. We'll come up here and we'll come into our import as here on the import tab. Basically the problem is if you import them in by default they will be they will have a slight filter to them a blur. You can see this pixel this doesn't look like pixel art right it's designed for uh, an HD game because we've got some uh, blurring and aliasing right here. So in order to fix that we need to come to our import tab right here and we need to turn off filter and re-import. You can see now we've got the, this is this is a little bit blurry too, but that's uh, this is how this was created. It's not actually pixel art, it's just low res. Um, but we can set our preset to 2D pixel. So we'll select 2D pixel, and then we'll do re-import, and then we'll come to preset and do set as default for texture. So once we set that as the default for our texture, we can click on this and delete it, yes. Now go into our resources and drag them all in and drop them into our file system over here again. And let's make sure that that works. We'll come into our world. We'll drag in a bush. 
and holds I'm holding scroll and or holding control and scrolling in order to zoom in and there that is some nice lovely pixel art right here so there we go we'll select that and delete it and these are just this is just the artwork and sound effects for the game so we haven't imported in any code we're going to be starting from scratch you will program everything along the way so the very first scene that we're going to make uh, right here in Godot you need a scene a scene is kind of your level it can also sometimes be the different objects in your game they can be their own individual scenes but each scene can be run it can have a camera attached to it this first scene that we make will be a level that our character can move around in and we're going to make this a 2d scene so we'll just click on 2d right here and we'll call this world so we'll call it world and we'll hit control s and we can save this scene and since this is kind of like our overall world scene that we're going to be making here i'm just going to save it here we could save it inside of this folder but i'm just going to save it here in the root of our directory so now we have this scene right here and we need to set up our camera if we run this game um so if we click the little play button up here to run it, you can see no main scene has ever been defined. So we need to select one. Sure, we can select a main scene. We'll select world, and then it will run our world scene here. The problem with this scene is that if you grab a bush or whatever and drag it in and run the game, you can see that this bush is tiny, and that's because it's pixel art. And uh, our game is not set up for a pixel art game yet. Our view here is not set up for a pixel art game. So let's actually drag this right here up a little bit higher. And we're going to come into our project settings. And we're going to set up our project settings to make this game work for a pixel art game. And the first thing we want to do is scroll down in general, in the general tab. We'll scroll, scroll down to display right here and window. And we can set our width to 320 and our height to 180. So that's a much better size for pixel art. Close. And you can see now that this little window right here, and it might be hard to see depending on uh, the resolution of the video, but this little window right here is set up for a pixel art game like this bush looks about to be the right size. So let's run the game again, right? Oh, well, that's just a really tiny window. So that didn't actually help, right? We want, to, we want this window to be bigger, but we want to be zoomed in. So how do we fix that? Well, project settings, we need to set our test width and test height. So this is basically the width and height of the window. Uh, so not the actual view in the game, but the window on our screen. So we'll set this to be 1280 by 720. I think that's four times the size. Yeah, that's four times the size. So we'll be scaling everything up by four times. So let's close out of our project settings, run the game again, and wait a minute, this is kind of back where we were before, right? Why does this, why is our windows the right size, but this hasn't scaled yet? Well, we need to fix one more thing, come into project settings. You need to set your stretch mode right here, and we need to set it to 2D. And so what that will do is it will stretch our small little win our small little game view here up to our test width and height here. And if we run the game again, you can see now we're getting exactly what we need for this pixel art game. So let's uh, d get, well, we can just, we can just leave that bush in, that's fine. It'll be a happy little bush, right? We've got Bob Ross here, happy little bush. What we wanna do now is create a character and we want to be able to move this character around inside of our game. That seems like a pretty good spot to start for an action RPG. We're gonna create uh, a new node. So when we created our first scene here, we actually attached our very first node. And so Godot uses a combination of scenes and nodes to organize your game. And the scenes, like we, we can create new scenes up here with this little plus button right here, are a collection of nodes organized in a tree structure. So you can see that this bush right here, it's got this little line coming down and it kind of indents a little bit. That's because it's a child of our world node. And you can actually see that our world node 
has a location right here up at the origin, 0, 0. And our child, this child node, its location is actually relative to the world node. So if we actually move this, it will move the child node with it if we move the world node. So we're going to do control Z to undo that. But that's a very important thing to realize. So if we make a node with our player that, that represents our player, and then we attach some sort of other nodes to that root node of the player, that base node, and they're all children of the player node, then they will follow the player as well. So if you have a sword or something that's attached to your player or whatever, it will move with the player. Its position will be relative to the player's position and that's really important to understand in our node system. So the, the way you organize the nodes in your tree over here is crucial for how your game is going to work. So let's start by clicking on our world here, and then we click this little plus button to add a new node. Now for this game, we're going to be using the, the node for our player is going to be a kinematic body. Now there are multiple different kinds of body nodes. We have a kinematic body, a rigid body, a static body. Static bodies are generally used for physical objects in your game that aren't going to be moved. Rigid bodies are used for objects that are going to use physics to control their behavior. And then kinematic bodies are nodes that are going to have collisions, but we're going to control their movement ourselves with code. And that's generally better for platform characters, or in this case, our action RPG characters. So we're going to select our kinematic body node, and it should be a child of our world node, you can see it's placed it in here. So the bush and the kinematic body are now siblings. So let's rename this here, we'll name it player. So our player, yeah, we can't see our player, right? And if we come over here, there's no, we can't actually set anything here to try and see our player. So how do we see our player? Well, let's look, we can see our bush, right? If we click on it, you can see that this is a node of type sprite. So uh, we can, in order to be able to see our player, we can add a sprite node to the player as a base. So we're going to click on our player here. And it's important to click on it because when we click add node, it will add it as a child of whatever one you have selected. So now we can search sprite here and we can add a sprite. Now this sprite node, if we move the player, the sprite node will move with it, right? And so that, that, rep that image of our player will move with the kinematic body because it's a child of it. Now if we come into our, uh, click on our sprite here, and we can see that it takes a texture. So we can come over here into our sprite, select player, and player.png, and drag this and drop it over our texture. Holy cow, that is one giant sprite, right? Now this is a sprite sheet and it contains all the animations for our player character. And there are a lot of them, a lot of animations here, a lot of frames for these animations. So in order to make it so it only shows uh, a single image, we need to come into our sprite and come into the animation section right here, over here on the right. These are the properties of the node that we're using. And uh, so make sure you have your sprite selected. We can come over here onto the right and we can set the number of H frames. So currently we've got it set to one. Well, it's gonna be quite a few actually. So let's just set this. I think it's 62, 62 H frames. We may, we may end up fixing that later uh, to make sure that we got that right but I think it's 62 H frames and now um, we can only see this very first frame of our player. And if we update this frame property over here, it actually will cycle through the frames and it looks like 62 was wrong. It might be 60. Yep, it's actually 60, so but at, you can see as we cycle through our frames here, it animates the character in the different motions that we're going to have. We're just gonna set that back to zero for now. We'll just use the very first frame for our player. And we can save. 
And uh, if you, this is something that happens quite often, like let's say we want to grab our player and move our player over here into the center of the room, right? we we'll grab the player and move it. Well, actually, we accidentally just grab the sprite node. Our player is still actually up here. We just moved the sprite. That's not what we want. So let's do control Z to undo that. And then we can uh, click on our player here and there's this little icon right here that says make sure the object's children are not selectable. We can click on that. Now if we click on the player, it will actually move the player itself and not just the sprite node of the player because uh, we've made it so that they're no longer selectable. And if we run the game again, we can see our player is now inside the room with the bush. We can't move around, uh, so we're going to be fixing that here soon. And we'll do that by adding a script to the player. So let's come to our player here, and there's a little icon right here that allows us to attach a new script. So we'll click this, and it's going to be called player. That looks good, but we want to make sure we put it in the right file. So let's come into our player folder here, and we'll open this, and so that's going to save it inside of our player folder, and the name of this script will be player.gd. And I'm going to be using GD script for this, Godot has other scripting options as well, visual scripting and also native script, which is basically uh, C++. And uh, you can also use C Sharp with Godot. However, GD script is the most developed and it has a lot of really great features. It's my favorite to use, so that's what we're going to be using. It's based off of Python, so it has a similar feel to Python. It's good for beginners, in my opinion. So let's create this new script and Godot is going to open up our script editor right here. And you can see up here at the top, we have 2D, which switches back to our scene or script. Now you'll probably have some other properties up here and uh, like 3D and asset library and stuff. I have actually chosen to hide those. If you go to editor and then manage editor features, you can actually hide a lot of the different features that you don't need. I've set up a 2D pixel art template and so I don't need the 3D, I don't need the asset library for this, I've just simplified it up here. If you want to do that as well, you can, you can choose which editor features you want to have included. So add some comments here. This is how you make a comment with the little hashtag or number sign. And you can see that this, we'll get rid of some of those comments, you can see that this code, this script, extends kinematic body 2D, and that just means it inherits from. Uh, so everything a kinematic body 2D can do, we can do inside of this script here. And you always extend the node that you're attaching the script to. So this node is a kinematic body 2D node, so we have to extend that. You can't, you can't extend something different from what you're attached to. The ready function right here, we're gonna add our very first line of code. We're gonna say print, hello world, the classic, right? Classic hello world. We can get rid of this pass line and save. And now we can run our game. So let's see what the ready function does. The ready runs right when this node is ready inside of the scene. So basically once it's added to our world scene and it's ready to go, it will run this line of code. So we're able to print hello world down in our debugger here. And there's a lot of different, if you, if you open up the documentation here, the help file, you can actually, if you see some code that you don't understand, you can type it, so underscore ready. And we can see this function called when the node is ready, when both the node and its children have entered the scene tree. If the node has children, their ready callbacks get triggered first. So the sprites ready got called before our ready. And uh, we can click on this over here to see what we're reading again. It's usually used for initialization. Yeah, we're going to be adding another callback function. If you see a little underscore right here, that means it's a callback function. And we're going to be doing the physics process function. Okay, and inside of here, we'll do print hello world. And we'll just delete our ready function here because we don't actually need it right now. So we'll save and run the game again. And you can see down, we're getting a whole bunch of hello worlds and it's gonna start freaking out because it's printing too many actually. 
That's a ton of hello worlds. So this is the physics process and this function gets called every single tick that the physics update. So if we search our help here and we paste in physics process, we can see our function here and called during the physics process step of the main loop. Physics processing means that the frame rate is synced to the physics. The de delta variable should be constant, so it shouldn't change, but delta is how long the last frame took. And it's only called if physics processing is enabled, but it's enabled by default when we create the function here. So this is a function that we're actually kind of overriding in Godot, and you don't need to know a lot about that, but basically this runs every single physics step. So this is where we're gonna move our character, okay? So we're going to get some input. So the important things that we're going to learn now are how to get input, how to do something when somebody presses a key. And we can use an if statement for this. If input dot is action pressed. And then we get some different options here that we can choose from. And we're going to choose UI right. Now in GDScript, when you, instead of doing curly brackets like this, like other languages do, you just use tabbing. And so you use a colon here at the, or a, yeah, colon here at the end, and then you hit the enter key and you can see it tabs over. So we've got one tab here for this, and then there's two tabs here for this one. We can say print, you pressed the right arrow key, okay? So we've got this tab here. So we know that this line of code right here is part of this if check, the logic of this check, because it's tabbed in twice here. If it was like this, then it wouldn't be part of that and we're gonna get an error. So having your tabs is really important here. And we can save and run the game. Now, uh, it won't do anything unless we press the right key and then it tells us you're pressing the right, right arrow key. And that's perfect. Well, instead of printing something, let's actually move our character. So we're going to say, and this, this is, this is a big no, no position dot X plus equals 10. Okay. So this is our X position and we're going to add plus equals add 10 to our X position. Every single frame, every single physics frame that we're pressing the right key, if we press Okay, and you can see we can move. Now the reason I said it's a big no-no is because you don't actually want to update the position manually like this on a kinematic body. I'll show you how we actually move this. So we'll create a variable here, var, and we'll call this velocity. We'll set this equal to vector, vector two dot zero. So a vector is basically just um, an X and a Y position. So our position is actually a vector as well. So it's an X and a Y position combined. So our velocity will be some X and some Y position that represents how much the change of our position, because that's what velocity is, right? It's the change of your current position. So we'll be adding this X and Y to our current position X and Y every single frame. And uh, we'll do just left and right for now. So we'll add if input dot is action pressed UI left. Okay, so instead of doing position plus equals 10, what we'll do is velocity dot X equals 10. Or if we're moving left, velocity dot what or X equals negative 10 because this is all on a grid, right? Our coordinate system is on a grid. Positive is to the right, negative is to the left. And then Godot, we want to tab over once. Godot has a magic little function for us called move and collide. And then all we have to do is pass in our velocity. So we'll say velocity like that. Oh, and we want to do one other thing. We actually want to make it so that if we're not, well, we'll just save it and run it like this because then we can see the problem first. Okay, press the right key, we move to the right. 
and 10 is really fast. You can see we have no friction. <laughs> we don't stop. Let's set this to um, 4 instead of 10 for now. And here we go. We can move left and right, but we don't stop. So how do we make it so that we stop? Well, you could do a check that says if we're not pressing the right key and we're not pressing the left key, but that would be a big pain, right? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to make this an else or an L if. So if we're pressing the right key, else if we're pressing the left key, and then we can add another case called else we're not pressing either of them, velocity dot x equals zero. That will set our velocity to zero. And now you can see we're moving back and forth. Our character is moving in the world. We could add all the other directions as well. So let's copy this. We'll add the four directions. We'll do up. Oops, that's UI accept. Up. And down. And instead of our X and Y, or our X is here, we'll do Y. And then here we'll set velocity. This is going to be pretty janky. <laughs> Oops, our velocity for going down, we actually have negative four. We want that to be positive four. Okay, let's press play again. You can move left and right and up and down. Can't move any direction at the same time. Wait, actually. <laughs> we seem to be able to move it at some angles. And that's because the way we've set up the code, I've set this up to be really simplified. Um, just using if statements. However, there's a trick here that is so much better, so much better than this, and that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to actually delete all this code and use the better method, which is creating an input vector. And so what this will create is a vector based on the input that we give it. So input vector equals vector 2.0. We'll set it to 0. We'll say input vector dot x is equal to input dot get action. Let's see, get action strength. Yep, that's right. Um, right, so the right key minus input dot get action strength, the left key. We'll say Let's give ourselves a little bit more room so we can see all this on one screen. Input vector dot y equals input dot get action strength down minus input dot get action strength up. Then we can say if input vector does not equal vector 2.0 velocity equals, no velocity, yeah velocity equals input vector else velocity equals vector 2.0. We'll update this a little bit more later, but let's talk about how this works. Okay? OpenPaint.net. We've got a grid. Okay? Now imagine that you have a analog stick, right? You're playing a game, you've got your controller, there's the analog stick, right? Now imagine that the, the farthest that you can go in any direction on the analog stick is a unit of one. Okay? It's one. So now let's say that you have your analog stick and you're holding all the way to the right. What do you think the coordinates would be on that analog stick? Well, you would have an X coordinate of one, right? And a Y coordinate of zero. And let's say you're holding all the way up. You would have 
a y coordinate of 1 and an x coordinate of 0. However, in games on a screen, it's actually reversed, so it would actually be a y coordinate of negative 1. Up is actually negative. On the left side, you would have negative 1 in the x and 0 in the y, and down here, you would have 0 in the x and positive 1 in the y, right? This is our input vector. This is what we're creating. If they're pressing the right key, but they're not pressing the left key, then uh, our action strength for right is going to be 1, and our action strength for left is going to be 0. So 1 minus 0 equals 1. So our x position is going to be 1 here, all the way to the right. Now imagine you're pressing down and to the left, like this. That would be an x axis of 1, and a y of also 1, right? And this is possible with our input. So we're creating this input vector, and it's going to be some coordinate on this graph like this. Then we can just set our velocity to be that and update our position, and our character will now move in all eight directions based on the input. And this movement is kind of jumpy, right? It's not very smooth. We're going to be fixing that, but that's going to be in a future video. This is going to be the basics for now. We're going to save this, and I'll be making another video, and we'll go into making that mo movement more smooth so it looks a lot nicer. Also, you may notice that we're moving faster at the diagonals, uh, and that's because... Um, if we're moving to the right, the maximum speed is only 1, but if we're moving to the right and up, then our speed to the right is 1 and our speed up is also 1, which actually gives us a faster diagonal speed. But we'll be fixing that as well. So that's going to be it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and that you learned something. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I will be trying to answer questions. I know I can never co cover everything perfectly. Everyone has different gaps in their knowledge. Everyone, you know, understands things differently. So if you have some doubts and questions, let me know in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. This video was made possible by my wonderful Kickstarter backers. This is part of my Godot course, my one-bit Godot course that I kickstarted a little while back. And part of that course was making a free action RPG series. So I've been really excited to start making this. I finished up the course and sent that out to the Kickstarter backers. So if you're interested in that course, there will be a link in this video and a link in the description and comments where you can check out the course as well. I go into a deep dive in Godot it covers all of the fundamentals of the engine, a very broad understanding of the engine, I would say. Yeah, there's been a lot of great, great support on that course through the Kickstarter. So as part of the Kickstarter, in this video and this video only, I'm going to list off the names of all the Kickstarter backers that help support this. Now, I'm not going to do have their full last name. I'm just doing a single letter for the last name because I want to respect their privacy. But yeah, you'll have whatever they put as their first name and then a single letter for middle name and last name. I'll list that in this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you all later.